Right now, it's only that. Because there is no, essentially, there is no discipline. coming along today. Um, so we had, I think, 130 people registered, so that's pretty amazing. Um, they're obviously not all in this room. So <laughs> welcome everyone in the room and welcome everyone who's joining us online. Um, this session is the Infrastructure Supporting the Fair Data Principles in the Life Science Research Practice. And this is a joint meeting of a group I'm involved with, which is the Life Science Data Infrastructures Interest Group, and you'll meet my other co-chairs shortly, um, and the Fair Sharing Working Group. So 
Um, we're going to uh, have a bit of a, you know, why are we here and what are we aiming to talk about? We'll have a short icebreaker um, and then we're going to go through um, really uh, some uh, analysis of, of how mature global infrastructures are in the life sciences. Um, we have quite a lot of flash talks. We're aiming to have 30 minutes for discussion. Um, we'll see how we go, depending on how the talks go. But we will have time for discussion and obviously we'll be here for the, um, for the, uh, for the whole conference. So um, I'm gonna present, uh, start off just with some, uh, oh, before I do that, this is a hybrid session. So um, in the room, we have uh, myself, Jeff Christensen, we have Volmar Okastrom, and we have Susan Gregory, um, and online we have Alicia Wilkin-Charlson, and we're the co-chairs of the Life Science um, uh, Data Infrastructure Interest Group. Um, so if you're online, uh, please uh, uh, feel free to add, uh, ask any questions. I think we do that in the Zoom chat. We'll be monitoring them and making sure we, we respond to those. Um, so a little bit about the Life Science Data Infrastructures Interest Group. We were only established last year, but we did spawn from an earlier group, which was the Elixir um, RDA Bridging Force Interest Group. Um, Elixir uh, is a pan-European uh, uh, effort to try and harmonise life science data infrastructures across Europe. Um, uh, you know, the world is bigger than Europe, and I guess you know, it was decided that it made a lot of sense to expand this conversation out to a more global, to a more global conversation. Um, so this is the charter. It's very wordy, but you know, the, the gist of it is that you know, life science it has already become increasingly data data intensive, um, and that's really due to the the, the methodologies that are now um, uh, involved in in generating omics data. So that's genomics or proteomics, metabolomics, stuff like that. Um, we really need to think about how do we sustain uh, infrastructure that is uh, available or, 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 or able to support that data around the whole research data life cycle. Um, and so our interest group really, we formed it as a really as a bridge between life science data infrastructures around the world um, and relevant RDA interest groups. So our interest groups aspires to have meaningful representation from diverse geographical regions all around the world. Um, so including North and South America, EU, Europe, UK, Eastern Europe, Africa, Asia, and Oceania. Um, we have a bit of a way to go with that. Um, but our other chair who can't be here today is from Africa. That's Mulder. She represents HRA Bionet in Africa. Um, so these are our, I guess, the infrastructures where our chairs are from. So. Um, I'm from the Australian Biocommons. Uh, Volmar's representing Elixir. Um, as I said, Nikki, who can't be here, represents HRA Bionet in Africa. Um, Susan represents NIH. And Alicia, who is online, represents the US Department of Energy Office of Science. Um, we want more people to join. So if people are interested and they represent a life science data infrastructure, please come and talk to us. Okay, so. This is our second RDA plenary. We met for the first time at the last plenary and we collectively decided that this is what our initial focus would be on. So we thought it would um, be very sensible to explore the type of digital asset management challenges that life science infrastructures around the world are trying to solve on behalf of their users. Um, when I say digital asset, we don't just mean data, but we mean anything that exists in binary. So it could be data, images, models, software, workflows, anything like that. We really wanted to, I guess, start to get a, a, a bit of a handle on how life science data infrastructures are trying to solve that challenge around, um, you know, on behalf of their users and, and start to evaluate how those solutions support the fair data principles. Um, and then, you know, we envisage that from our interest group, we what, we'll get to a point where we do want to synthesize and share best practice recommendations for infrastructures um, to better support their um, principles. Okay, so just over the last month or so, our group chairs, we've been busy. We've gone off and we've surveyed the operators of a number of infrastructures around the world with respect to the fairness of their resource. So I'm not going to read through those, but um, Susan's going to talk more about that. Um, and we'll present an overview of the survey results. And then we have um, six flash talks today. 
um, of, of uh, people who are representing various infrastructures. So some of these people are with us in the room. Some of us, some of these people are going to join us online. And some of these people are asleep because it's two o'clock in the morning where they're based. So we're going to we're, we're going to present a recorded talk. Um, okay. So really, as I said, you know, we we want to spend a lot of time exploring how infrastructure solutions are, are supporting fair principles. So start to think about future synthesis. Um, so that's the that's the whistle stop tour of the life science. Um, infrastructure interest group, and now over to Alison, who'll yeah, who'll fill us in on the um, fair sharing working group. Hi everyone, I'm Alison Lister, and I work with fair sharing at the University of Oxford. I am going to give you, as he said, a very whistle. I don't know what's just happened. I didn't touch anything, honest. <laughs> uh, very quick tour of, of the fair sharing working group and its outputs uh, recently in the past year or so. First of all. I thought I should at least tell you what fair sharing is. We are uh, an interrelated registry of curated descriptions of standards, databases, and policies across all research areas. And what we do is we try to promote those standards, databases, and policies that the community develops to help enable fair data by connecting those resources with the researchers and the data stewards and the librarians who need them. We have nearly 4,000 records across these three registries. We also have over 1,200 maintainers and um, community champions who work on these records because every single one of them is manually curated. And there is a distribution across all the research areas. There is a slight bias, as you may notice, towards the natural sciences. This comes as a result of our history, which was in the life sciences, but we are across all research areas now. And I mentioned that we have a lot of stakeholders, and yes, we do. Indeed, the RDA is here as uh, fair sharing is one of the working groups in the RDA, but also a number of other resources and infrastructures. Moving on to our first output, bearing in mind the time, and that is the Fair Sharing Community Champion Program. I am one of the RDA EOS Future Domain Ambassadors, and as part of this ambassadorship, we have launched the Community Champions Program over the last few months. And this is where we get domain experts who have come as volunteers from the RDA, from EOS, from all over the world. If you're interested, let me know. To help curate our content, yes. Um, but in return, they gain attribution. They gain engagement with like-minded peers. They gain networking and expertise in data curation. Not only do they curate our content, but they also work on infographics and educational material, which we are releasing the first set of this week for the RDA plenary. It's fantastic. You can see the ones in blue are the ones that we are, oops, that's a slightly old slide. Ignore the policies. That one will be in a few days. We have six. The other six are available now if you go to slash educational. And what they're doing is our community champions are writing this text and we're building the infogra infographics around what they say is important to them in the context of standards, databases, the different stakeholder types that come to fair sharing. And try to click. Oh, nothing's happening. I'm breaking everything. <laughs> uh, so Zoom <laughs> claims that I still have remote control over the session. So maybe that has something to do with it. Volmer said he would deactivate that and we gave me permission for my talk. Uh, but uh, I don't know how any of this works. What well, yes. you can see in the slightly smaller form is one of the infographics on the right hand side, which you can download from Zenodo now. If you go to slash educational on fair sharing, so fairsharing.org slash educational, as it says down here, and click through there, you can get to our infographics, which have been produced in collaboration with our community champions. And very briefly, just to finish off, because I do still have time and a captive audience, the other two outputs of the Fair Sharing Working Group recently. And the first of that is the fact that we have been working with the DCC and what was fair is fair with their data policy checklist and also with the output of the data policy standardization and implementation interest group. I dare you to say that five times fast, which is their journal data policy feature set. So what we did is we took those two different outputs, the one from the RDA and the one from the DCC. Many of you will have attended their workshop on Monday morning. Um, and what they produced is the list of important information that should be present in policies to help enable fair data. So we added this metadata to our fair sharing records, which you can see in teeny tiny writing on the right hand side, 
that tells you that you can filter our policies based on these attributes that are deemed relevant by both the RDA and the DCC. And not only do we do that, I don't know why there's a bar up there, I'm sorry about that. For policies, we also are in the process of doing that for our database records in fair sharing because we are also contributing, which you can't see because of the, I'm worried about touching it because I fear I'll break something. Um, it's the database, uh, <laughs> The database, uh, the repository, data repository attribute working group, which you can see right there, of which we are having our meeting. Oh, they're going to uh, tomorrow or the next day. It's in the it's in the agenda. I promise you should come. We're building a set of attributes that should be used to describe repositories, and those attributes will also be incorporated into the fair sharing record. So what we're doing in a in a constant fashion in a way that. It's just really fun because the RDA is fun, is we are integrating with the, all these different working groups in relation to standardization, to databases, to data policies. And we're listening to what the community has to say and implementing that in fair sharing, where you can go and you can navigate a graph of the landscape of the databases that people are building and the standards that those databases implement, the policies, the how they're recommending standards and databases, and how standards are integrating with each other. Does one build on another? Does, does one, do, are some group together to make a package? And our databases sharing data, are they sharing the code? All this information is created in the network graph and fair sharing for you to explore. And I, I'm going to stop there. And I hope that uh, if you have any questions, you'll let me know later. I think there was, I hesitate to change. I'm not going to speak. Again. I wasn't moving when I was, the extra 48 seconds was due to the technology issues. <laughs> That's the thank you slide, by the way. <laughs> okay. Wow. All right, so we're going to do a short survey of who's here uh, to get a feeling uh, and maybe connect uh, each of us for future discussions at the later part of this uh, session. So we're going to use Mentimeter. Those of you who are online will find this link in the meeting notes. Uh, those of you who are here physically can use the QR code and you should enter a <laughs> Mentimeter slide. Uh, I'm going to leave this up for a small moment. Those of you who have already uh, gotten this uh, into your phone you can start answering the questions. So it's self-paced. Uh, and I'm not going to wait for everyone to answer since we only we have five minutes for this. Uh, I will step through some of the uh, results that we have at the time when I'm showing the slide. And then maybe if we have time, we could show the slide at the end if more people uh, have contributed. Uh, so I should be able to switch my view over to my screen here. Mm -hmm. And um, let's see, here we go. So this is <laughs> the uh, countries or regions that we represent. Uh, so there's a lot of people from Sweden and Europe, which is not surprising given that the cleanery is, is here. So it's easy to travel. Uh, there's no distinction between online or offline. Uh, so maybe there's also some influence on the time zones here. Uh, but it, it's good to see that we have representation across many different countries. So UK, France, Netherlands, Germany, and then if there are any of the small ones that are really moving around fast here. So we have some from China and uh, Asia, Earth, yes, <laughs> fantastic. Uh, I'm gonna move it to the next slide, uh, which is on uh, kind of how you would classify yourself uh, in the scope of uh, your role and, and uh, your interest in infrastructure. So, I mean, if you're a user of it, or if you are someone who's really directing the uh, infrastructure and, and what it should be doing. Uh, and I see that we have a lot of support staff, perhaps working at infrastructures, uh, and I mean, the, this doesn't really give us the, the exact numbers, but we have 64 responses so far. So you can try to do the weighting in your, your head uh, instead. Maybe we can analyze these numbers at a later point and ask those who decide if you want to join this interest group or not. Uh, it's free and mm -hmm. we, we will be using the <laughs> mailing list a little bit in the future. Uh, and then for the expectations for this session, 
this is a really moving, <laughs> really, really moving around. So, I mean, inspiration and ideas and knowledge, I think this is really good because that's what we uh, will offer through these flash talks. Uh, and uh, maybe we can go back to this slide a bit at the end of the session, but I'm going to stop sharing now. And if you want to see the results, there's also a link in the presentation slides that I will paste in the Zoom chat. Uh, and uh, it will be in the, uh, the meeting notes as well. So those of you who can physically can go back to it and, and view it. And then we should be able to go back to the slides again. And from here, I think we hand over to someone else. So let me hide this floating thing. Right, so Susan. Thanks, Wilmer. Thanks, Sarah. I have the pleasure of working with uh, my co chairs on giving you a summary of the survey we did on the perspective of infrastructures that are supporting the fair data principles. Um, you'll see our co-chairs. So uh, this is an informal survey we conducted with 13 life science data infrastructures. Uh, the infrastructures were from the Europe, from Europe, from Australia, I think that's hidden, but that should be what it says, the US. Six uh, infrastructures identified as being mature. Mostly the uh, assessment was in terms of the uh, lifespan of the infrastructure or in terms of its development um, profile. So infrastructures decided themselves if they were mature or if they were gonna identify as moderately mature, uh, which four did, and then three infrastructures identified as uh, relatively um, young in terms of either their funding profile or in terms of the development that they wanted to do. There's uh, no real correlation exactly about the maturity of an infrastructure and the amount of data that's uh, served and, and stored in the infrastructure or the access of that data by its users, either in the platform itself, in the cloud, or downloaded. There's a slight correlation between the number of users, but not strongly. So you'll see that in a moment. So, and I don't know if I can move the box, but uh, <laughs> we de-identified the resources. So we're not calling anybody out, but you can just see in terms of the maturity of the life cycle of the resource, the green box is, is very mature. The yellow box is somewhat mature and the red box is early. We asked each infrastructure do you assist your users to plan for their data management and sharing plans? That's certainly important to NIH with our new policy, probably important to you. Do you assist your users in collecting or generating data? Sharing data? Uh, I don't know what E is, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened with that one. Maybe it's just generate. I, oh, it might be generate, yeah, thanks. <laughs> do you process the data? Do you pre-process it? Is it raw data? Uh, do you analyze, do you provide a platform with analytics? Do you uh, preserve the data? <clears throat> if not all, have some preservation characteristics. Share the data in a platform that is accessible. <clears throat> and is that data then expected to be reused by the community? And so you can see sort of where we are with um, the life cycle of data and the intersection of that with the resources. And it's, it's really very interesting um, the way that different resources are are adapting to the data life cycle. And there certainly is, you're gonna see a lot of interesting work that we can do um, to help resources manage the data life cycle and also to assist in the FAIR principles. So we asked research, uh, resources a number of questions and you'll see them at the top with the different icons. So for example, we asked resources, how do researchers find your, your infrastructure? You might be surprised that the number one response was word of mouth, Google, publications, and seminars. Very few register on R3 data on fair sharing. So there's a lot of work we can do, a lot of work. A few resources are required by the funding agency. In other words, the agency puts in their funding announcement, you will share your data with this repository. We asked our uh, infrastructures, how do researchers find the data assets? Do they do you use a GUI? Do you have a dashboard? 
almost extensively. Everybody has either APIs, GUIs, interfaces, or portals, and there's that's the strength. But how do researchers determine what types of data assets are housed in your resource? Here again, we had some interesting responses. <coughs> um, data site came up once, but most of our resources are exposing their data through data dictionaries or data catalogs or from exposing metadata and making that searchable. A few resources have data dashboards or, or other types of interfaces. Do you infrastructure use persistent identifier? Most, if not all, use DOIs or GUIDs. Those are uh, adaptable specific identifiers. You might see this more on the clinical side, or they have very specific identifiers. Some use multiple identifiers. So in, in that sense, we are making data citable. What metadata is required for your digital um, assets in your infrastructure? And again, this is really dependent on the type of infrastructure that's that we're looking at. It could be if it's more clinical, we're looking at common data elements or, or OMOP, which is a, a structured data model, or in other senses, uh, the metadata is very community driven and very specific, or no metadata. It just user puts in what they put in and that's what's served. So I think again here, there's some, there's some work we can do to be a little bit more consistent. And I think that's something that RDA brings to the table. We asked our infrastructures, what about the accessibility of your, of your infrastructure? And again, you'll see that response at the top. Apologize for the, um, the blocking of one of the questions. So we asked the digital asset, um, is your data open and free, or is there some kind of authentication sure. protocol? And for the most part, <clears throat> most of our resources have some kind of controlled access in some form or another. We asked our resources, what's that? What's that? Um, what is that? And here, mostly it's uh, either registered or off. In some cases, like at NIH, we do have very particular protocols to data use agreements and data access committees. Uh, and then, um, I'm sorry that I can't really see what the last question is. Let's see if I can move it. No. Oh, sure. <laughs> Go back. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. Ah, thanks. And then let me see if I can go back. There we go. Okay. And then we asked about the metadata that's recorded in the asset. And what happens if you delete your data? Will that metadata persist so that at least people knew that there was some sort of data on this topic in the infrastructure? And um, it's a mixed bag. Yes, six resources do retain the data, even if uh, the metadata, even if the data is no longer available. Seven um, either don't or there's no <laughs> policy or they don't act what they're not. And this is a question that a number of our resources said, we don't delete the data, so it's always there. So I'm not sure what would happen if the data was still no longer. <laughs> we asked about interoperability. So this is a really fascinating um, response, number of responses, and you'll see the questions on the top. For example, we asked, the infrastructures about data standards and metadata, guidelines, terminologies, are they using fair sharing? And for the most part, yes, people are using interoperable metadata and data standards, but it depends on the infrastructure. If you're looking at the more clinical side, it's FHIR, Fast Healthcare Interoperable Resources, APIs, DERS, and a, a few, a number of resources said we're really looking at the GA4GH. Uh, standards for interoperability. Others are using um, other types of models, fair sharing, JSON, YAML. So it, it sometimes it just varies, but I think we are starting to see more community-driven interoperability standards. And there was a great session not too long ago on semantic interoperability. So I think here again, we can see some good work from RDA. What about data that's processed through open or proprietary tools? And for the most part, most of our resources that we interviewed are using um, mostly open tools. A few do have a mix of open and proprietary tools. What about standards to connect? Again, we saw some similarities between that and the interoperability metadata. Fire to connect clinical data repositories is widely used. Some have very specialized relationships within consortiums. You'll see that with Elixir, for example. Others use open Dev framework and others use this systems biology markup language, much more basic biology in that case. 
Um, and then we ask, do you actually interoperate with anybody? Do you have an, an actual resource consortium that is forming some kind of federated and interoperable uh, activity? And five of them, yes, with, within their defined consortium. So Elixir, for example, or, or our NIH uh, Cloud Interoperable Program. Six resources um, do interoperate within a particular funding agency, and then two do not interoperate. So most, what I think is really a good takeaway message is that um, there's really a, a desire to actually create something that's much greater than just one any one resource by creating some interoperable standards and then working towards that interoperable goal. So I think that we are moving as, as a community into this, this space. And then lastly, we ask about reusability. So for example, what metadata and provenance do you track? And most resources do have some type of, of uh, provenance, whether they're tracking the data or they're tracking the data and the metadata or they're tracking the workflows. Not often do, do folks say we're tracking data, metadata and workflows. So I think there's some room for growth. Then we asked about what about your community standards? We got a lot of interest in, in schema.org and fire and OMOP. And if we had one that was a, an imaging repository, you'll see DICOM there. Um, and then others are looking at workflow and community standards. Importantly, we asked about quality about your data and four resources provide uh, some type of information on the form of the, of the data quality and eight don't provide any information. So I think that we could see a little growth in this area as well. And then lastly, on reuse license, many, many resources are actually have some sort of license, um, a number of them specified. So you see that by only two did not have any type of license for, for reuse. Do you mind yes. elaborating on quality? Sure. So um, what would be sort of the either the the variance of the data that you're collecting. So there's a lot, there's a data that has quite a lot of um, scatter in the data points, for example, or um, maybe the metadata is not very rich. And so you're not really sure about um, the exactness of the data. So it could be in any way that the, the, um, the infrastructure was uh, deciding what they, how they wanted to collect and, and serve to their research community, how, how, reusable and reliable and reproducible that data is. And that's not something I think that many resources do because they're, most of us are getting data from a research community and we're not necessarily asking the researchers for that input. And so I think there's, there's somewhat bit of a challenge um, when we are working with research communities to make sure that they are, are providing us enough rich metadata, enough information to, to actually do that assessment. Does that help? So it's a sort of score. Yes, and I'm not sure we actually do a lot in terms of the score of, of data, but there's probably a lot of rich work that we could do in that space. And then we asked a, an open-ended question that's supposed to help feed our discussion later, which is, what, what didn't we ask you that you want to tell us about, about the FAIR principles for infrastructures? And so I've, I've listed them here, and I won't necessarily read them because it's quite a lot, um, but they, they, we got an enormous amount of information on findability of data and of infrastructures. Uh, some really good points were made about, we should have some standard metadata criteria that we're all collecting so that we could actually know more about the data in our infrastructures or the granularity um, of our information needs to be much deeper. In terms of accessibility, really showing the amount of data of the record on the landing page or in some way exposing the metadata in such a way that, that it could the data would be much more accessible. So when people thought about accessibility, they really thought about the data inside their repository. And in terms of interoperability, um, much more focus on improved machine actionability, much more functional DOIs for workflows. And in terms of general principles, we heard that uh, implementation guidelines are fair for infrastructures. So fair is wordy and meaningless without you know, principles or guidelines for the infrastructures. 
and defining what a fair infrastructure is as a concept with something that folks told us would be an important activity to do. Yes. Uh, um, you have taken the, the data lifecycle management process as a reference. Uh, you also consider the usability of the infrastructure as such. So how a research team would experience that infrastructure as it's presented to them. We, we asked a few questions about um, user experience and UI, and UI UX, uh, and it was sort of wrapped up into the reusability question. And not every infrastructure had an extensive user, you know, sort of user interface or user experience. We see that more now with uh, infrastructures that are developing sort of all in one platform. So you'll have your, your, your data repository that's serving and, and sort of cleaning the data to some extent, but they're also providing a, a suite of analytics as part of that infrastructure. And there the UI UX was much more important and sort of scored higher than um, a little bit more uh, longer standing repositories, which are meant as strictly repositories where researchers in fact, don't even have the access of the data. They have to just download it onto their workspace and use it there. So there were a few few infrastructures that were um, in that sort of um, genre. And so I think it really depends, user experience really depends on, on how your user wants to interface with, with, with the infrastructure. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yes. Um, we have talked about, I would say, from the different point of view on infrastructure kind of grid. Data infrastructure, but also real infrastructure, the underlying stuff. How important is a certificate, a certificated infrastructure important for the data fair approach on top? It's hard. I think that's a good question to open it up for the discussion at the end. From my point of view, I think it's very important. Um, but I'm looking. Um, yeah, from, from my point of view, it's very, very important, but I, I'm not, I'd love to have that as, if you don't mind, as part of the open-ended discussion at the end. Yeah. Yes, I, I think it, it affects at the end the reusability of data, right? Yes, absolutely. I really do. Mm. So, it yeah. It's a main principle in research, and if you cannot fulfill it, we will be lost at the end. So, I, this for me is the last slide, and what is going to happen next is that we are going to hear from just a few uh, infrastructures um, who sort of participated in our survey. So you're, you'll hear a little bit about from their point of view and their perspective. And then I think after that, we have some discussion. So with that, I'm turning it over to my colleague, uh, Valentina Di Francesca. She's from the International uh, Human Genome Institute. And thank you. Thank you, thank you Susan. Yeah, you have to sit here. So. Yes. Three, a couple of here. Yeah, there's also two here, and I Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Valentina Di Francesco, and I'm from the National Human Genome Research Institute, uh, one of 27 NIH uh, National Institutes of Health in the United States. And I'm here to talk about the NGRI genomic analysis, visualization informatics lab space uh, and how we've been trying to pursue the FAIR principle. Um, so the short name for what I just said is ANVIL. Uh, so from now on, I'm gonna talk about the ANVIL. Um, so what is the ANVIL? Uh, the ANVIL is uh, a data sharing and analysis platform that was established by NGRI to support the genomic research community. Um, it, it consists of uh, various components. So first of all, it's genomic data, uh, but it's also expanding to other data types, genomic data and associated phenotypic information, um, <clears throat> experimental metadata and so on. So it is controlled access data. Right now it, it supports almost five petabytes of data set. Um, this is actually an early resource. It's not even five years old. Um, and it, the governance for this control access data is coming from the data access committee of NGRI. Mm -hmm. um, and because it's um, genomic data sensitive information, um, basically the ANVIL is following high standards of data security, is FedRAM certified. 
It is a cloud-based uh, infrastructure. Um, it's supported through the Google Cloud Platform, uh, and it is expanding to Microsoft Azure. Um, this is going to happen over the next year. Um, and also, uh, what is important is uh, it's an infrastructure that allows for collaborative analysis of data sets. Um, and also, we are using this platform for training purposes, especially to engage you know, the younger generation to really come and uh, utilize it and, and basically learn to do uh, genomic data analysis. Um, so, but what is very important is that this is going to become the uh, data sharing platform for the Institute. Basically, we're going to ask, uh, basically suggest, strong suggestion that every single uh, funded program is going to deposit, especially if it is genomics data, data into the ANVIL. So it is the major data sharing platform uh, moving forward for our institute. So what goes under it? Um, the foundation uh, of Envil is the Terra platform. Pla uh, Terra is a platform that uh, was established by the Broad Institute. Um, and the key components of the Terra platforms are those in the green box, uh, basically, I uh, already uh, mentioned that it is cloud-based and basically the, the Terra platform has a Terra data repository. Uh, it also has uh, a tools repository um, and it also has workspaces. Again, the, work, the concept of a workspace is really a sandbox is where uh, either the investigators individually can upload their data sets, they, they can upload their own tools, they can do the analysis themselves, or they can basically share their own data sets and tools with a group of collaborators that can control access to data and tools and um, select who they want to work with. <clears throat> So those are the four key, and, and, and on top of it, there are a number of APIs that are basically helping with the user interfaces. Um, and the users could be, you know, data submitters. Um, I just said we have five petabytes of data, so lots of people that are uploading data sets into the platform. We're also catering to tool developers. Um, and also, um, we're also facilitating our consortia. Uh, sometimes they need to set up portals um, to their own data sets and so on. So um, we're also catering to those type of people. So going a little bit deeper and don't worry about the details of this, um, but going a little bit deeper into the architecture on how Envil is built. Um, and mostly just I needed to highlight how we're meeting, we're trying to meet the FAIR principles. This is very much work in progress. Um, so I, I just want to go through uh, how a user engages with the Anvil. Um, so a, a, a typical user will go to the Anvil uh, website and basically go through a browse, a browse browsing through the data set catalog. The data set catalog mm -hmm. itself is very basic, has accession numbers that we get from NCBI, DBGAP. Um, and then it has mm -hmm. uh, information about the consent groups, um, and, and, and so on, extremely basic information, the size of the data set and so on. And then most users come to us uh, and they already know what they're looking for. Um, and so, so they, they will select the data sets that they want to use. And then uh, as I said, most of it is controlled access. So they submit a data access request. Um, data access request is traditionally um, have been going through DBGAP. Um, but we are also expanding uh, a different uh, methodology for uh, users to submit their access request. And we're going we're to use the dual system, which uses uh, a data use ontology, um, which basically is an ontology for consent groups. And that is, should facilitate uh, processing um, by the DAX, by the Data Access Committee of the data request, you know, approval, not approval, adding, you know, uh, requesting additional information and so on. Um, so use of ontology for, uh, to process the uh, data access request is one way in which we're trying to support FAIR. Um, and then um, assuming the uh, user gets is approved, then it gets into the Teradata repository. The Teradata repository is... Um, is transitioning <clears throat> into the adoption of the Terra, uh, inter, uh, Terra interoperability model. Uh, it's a brand new model. It's a, it's a, it's a, 
and also for OMOP, especially for dealing with clinical data, clinical data sets. Um, and then, so once the user is on basically inside the Terra platform, again, it has access to um, the data sets uh, in the Terra data repository, which are basically provided through DIR, the DIR standards. That's a, a standard that comes from GA4GH. Um, and then uh, with respect to accessing also metadata and phenotypic information, the user will be able to utilize the um, uh, data explorer user interface. Again, this is uh, something very new that is going to happen over the next few months. And but through doing that, basically what allows the user to do is to actually really build cohorts based on the uh, sensitive information, the phenotypic information, the clinical information, whatever you know, people, the submitters have decided to share. Okay, so that's really the key aspect. So when I talked about the Envil portal, which is complete open access, there is no sensitive information that the user can do to build their own cohorts. They need to get approval, and then they will be able to build the cohorts and integrate data sets. And so finally, um, uh, the analysis workspaces, that's the area where um, we're deploying a number of analysis tools like Galaxy, Bioconductor, the Mm -hmm. you know, the traditional um, uh, packages for genomic data analysis. And so um, basically allowing people to reuse the data and also reutilize analysis workflows as well. So um, I talked about a number of uh, things in which we are um, trying to pursue uh, fair principles. Uh, again, I talked about the data use ontology, GA4GH standards, FIRE, OMOP, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, the good news is that AMBO doesn't work in isolation. Uh, we're actually trying to work with similar systems that um, basically that have been set up by different institutes across the NIH, like Biodata Catalyst, that was established by NHLBI or the uh, NCI Cancer Data Research Commons, the CRDC, sorry. Um, and so we're trying to basically, uh, all together, and these resources are supporting 12 petabytes of data. And that does not even include the, all the data that is that are on the NCBI resources. So there's obviously a big need for interoperability of these resources with each other. And that's why we're all testing together uh, their standards, for example, we all agreed to use it. We all agreed to use PFP as a data exchange uh, mechanisms across resources and fire. We're testing fire in, in many ways and so on. So um, that's how we're aiming to establish an interoperable data ecosystem at the NIH, working with Susan and others and so on. So I'll stop here um, and that's it. Okay, thank uh, Susan and, uh, and organizers for inviting me. Um, I'm going to talk about import, uh, which is a repository. So I'm addressing the issues from the repository perspective. And uh, so I'm from the National Institute uh, of uh, Allergen Infectious, it's another NIH institute. And uh, so the uh, our institute funds about 40% uh, of immunology research uh, at NIH. And uh, so we're responsible uh, to support the, the new discoveries and also to maximize the data <laughs> in two ways. One is to um, to make the, the data in the reproducible form. And so then the people can uh, uh, use it. And the other thing is to, to make it uh, reusable to, to generate the new hypotheses. And, and basically that is the, uh, the missions of, uh, of imports. And uh, so, um, so this is the, the on the on the left here is the the import uh, the web page, and then from there you can discover uh, discover the um, the data of interest. And once you find it, you can download it and, and use it uh, for free I, and for any legal purposes. And uh, so. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the other uh, on the other uh, so that we, we don't actually have a license because uh, there is there is a lot to involved, but I think that's kind of the the uh, the 
the legal people came up with the words. <laughs> it seems more inclusive. Uh, on the uh, on the right, uh, you can see the uh, the data in the import is very carefully curated uh, using about like forty five standards, and so that is the process to ensure the the quality, the uh, interoperability, and and the integrity, and that's all important for the reusability. Uh, and so the um, the other thing I want to uh, mention that. Uh, you can see the import definitely support the FAIR principles and produce FAIR data. But the FAIR data is only as good as the process and the people that are free the repositories. And so, um, so in that sense, uh, the uh, so import uh, is a big supporter for, for trust principles, uh, which is, uh, if you haven't uh, heard of it, is a, is a transparency. Uh, responsibility, user focus, sustainability, and technology. And essentially is to, to be transparent with what you can do and you cannot do. And, and be, be, be responsible for fulfilling your promises and be user focused and, and then using the sufficient technology uh, to make the, uh, the operation and like make data fair for the long term. So that's kind of the trust and a relationship between trust and, uh, and fire. Like, you know, one is the machine readable and the other is to make it uh, for the long term. And so then, um, so with, with that, I think the, uh, uh, that the, you can see a lot of uh, the things that can, can be happening. Uh, so I, I gave you a, a couple of uh, the examples that the uh, now uh, <laughs> the people can use the reuse import data for some for some uh, pretty cool uh, research, and but one thing I want to point out is like so the the uh, the um, the right dot here is the uh, the reuse paper uh, started showing up the using just the using the import data. You, you see, it kind of it take a while. It's not like immediately you release the data can be reused, but uh, in the later years and now, if people have idea. And they can generate some uh, the uh, examples out there, like some some uh, some things there. You can just using the data and to publish uh, like in the uh, some top journals like like Nature Cells and other other ones. And then the the other thing I want to touch upon is what um, what Susan mentioned about that like for import repository, and maybe it's a little bit uh, from other repositories. Like we involve with the, um, the depositor or researchers from very early before even they get a grant. And so uh, uh, Anu like, uh, also here is the program officer for import. So we kind of work with the, um, the, the big consortium that generated data. So, so in a sense, we know the data coming in like even like two or three years before they come in. And that's how we kind of make, maintain this ecosystem and maintain the quality and ma maintain the uh, potential to be reused to generate uh, a good science and good hypothesis. But I wanna, I wanna stop here. Okay, so uh, now I think we're gonna hear from Lindsay Anderson. Lindsay, are you online? Yep. I'm here. Excellent. Well, I'll drive the slides for you. So over to you, Lindsay. Okay, great. All right, great. Um, my name is Lindsay, of course. Um, I represent a unique perspective here, actually. I'm a, a DOB employee. I'm also a user of some of the services in which I'm gonna talk about, and then also curate a little bit. So, oh, too, too far. <laughs> Perfect. Oh. I'm trying to get you up as well. <laughs> right. I'll just you can still see the number. When she talks to use that. We can see. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. We still there? Yep, I'm at your mercy. So. <laughs> I'm just going to 
Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Perfect. Um, all right. Well, if uh, we're going to focus on a, a small subsection of the Department of Energy Science, uh, Office of Science, sorry, in the Biological Environmental Program of Cyber Infrastructure. So this is particular to a certain area of research under the DOE. For those who aren't really familiar, the left in the middle is sort of um, a little bit how this infrastructure is designed. We have national labs and we have user facilities and we have computational resources. So on the left, we have Berkeley highlighted specifically because they are integrated in many of these resources you'll see off to the right. And then myself uh, at PNNL, one of our user facilities as well feeds into one of in a few of these, these computational resources. So um, here there's quite a strategic design that a lot of these capabilities build off of one another and where one may or may not appear to have some sort of a functionality is because the integration with other infrastructure is what really highlights the power of those capabilities working together. So on the left, there's a little snack of, of numbers for those who are curious. That was in one of our BSSD annual reports. We report every year about the outputs of a lot of our capabilities and um, project implementations. And so on the right, I actually went a little bit, maybe too far and actually kind of looked at these resources myself with the, uh, the data lifecycle metrics that was talked about earlier. And so you have the high, the medium, the low, and not applicable with the colors over here. And so KBase, JGI, and NMDC, which of course, KBase is a DOE genomic science program knowledge base, which integrates with a cyber structure with JGI and NMDC. So JGI is one of our you know global leaders in genomic sequencing. So we have high users, high content, and we support various projects around the globe. So we have at least three, more than 3,000 users and over 2,000 of them are international worldwide. So along with that, some of the project and infrastructures that go with those are also the National Microbiome Data Collective, a collaborative, um, which is NMDC. And then to the right is a repository that supports the earth and environmental science um, division programs. And so the interesting part here is with some of these where it's gray, they don't apply because they, they're really high strength in other spaces, so JGI, where you create and plan of user projects. There's technically a double DMP involved in a lot of these, these infrastructures. And so when you have a user service and then a project, you have two separate DMPs that apply. And so um, where maybe run resource isn't known to have high planner collection, maybe like KBase, is because their strength is suited you know, along a different element of the data life cycle. And so you'll see, off to the left, there's a link fair data wheel. And then there you'll kind of see some of those, those actions um, with each resource. So I will note that there's high um, analysis strength in this, this core group of capabilities. And they all do something very different. It's a very high computational resource driven infrastructure. And so with that, um, there's a lot of lifecycle pre and post processing that goes on. Um, we can... I'll let you kind of peruse the metrics on your own, but we can go to the next slide. So this is just an overview of some of the fair elements in the cyber structure or cyber infrastructures. And so um, this is what maybe a typical uh, computational workflow would look like where you have integrations across systems and facilities and services. And then you also have an element of harmonization between them that go on with the metadata or different ontologies and other structures like that as well. And so the Kind of the beauty about this design is that it all supports a scope and a sequence along the data life cycle and you'll see that with some of these implementations um, on the bottom right is a kind of a metric there was 19 dark questions in the survey and i kind of used a point system to rank how each one evaluated whether their fair components and so i will note this is how it applies into their infrastructure whether you it's really obvious or not when you visit those infrastructures um, and then to the top corner, they all do have a record and fair sharing, which, uh, you know, I may or may not know a little bit on uh, earlier. And so with those, as these, these implementations grow, so can the connections and the visual outputs of how they're interconnected um, with those records. And so if we move on, I can just cover a few of what the, the core concepts are. So in the next slide was the researchers um, ability to search and find data assets. So navigating data assets, what were some of the key challenges? And the overall was that 
Um, they all have really great, great fair strengths individually, um, but each would like to enhance the way either their users are navigating the resource itself, how they can support larger scale um, analyses in general, and then also improving high complex submissions with a lot of metadata robustness. And so there's quite a few general functionalities, but for the most part, they all do well. It's a matter of can you display it in a way that makes sense to the user, the audience, the stakeholder group. So you can go to the next slide. So interoperability is interesting. Um, a lot of these are really focused on the individual infrastructures themselves. And so that would be, it's, it's more of a challenge to inter interoperate across infrastructures versus then within each one by themselves. And so I think that there's a lot of dedicated effort going into a lot of these resources to make sure that they align to a lot of common and developing standards. And then you go to the next slide. So data reuse um, and some of the challenges there. So um, they all have gaps either in some sort of a legacy decision with out fair in mind or there's a limited cultural influence in terms of how that fair awareness has grown within those infrastructures, um, enhancing the interoperability for compatible integrations across them. Um, will take a little bit of work. I think some of the challenges of resolving uh, past and future sample to data process information and some of the ongoing architectural challenges with that. So that was some interesting feedback. And then if you go to the last slide, So the, the take home here is that um, there is an iterative process and it's continuous, and it really depends on the technology development, the user stakeholder um, audience as well, and then uh, what's developing with these large infrastructural data collections as they continue to grow and build on common missions. And so I think one of the, the main things that's hard is harmonizing across them with metadata structures, ontologies, data model integrations. And so that's always a work in progress. Um, KBase, GGI, and NDC, which are focused on the genomic science program, for them, I think improving representative data displays is huge, navigation and the end user process. So sometimes the high driven capability on the back end isn't always based front. And so I think that's something that all do a really good job in their own way, but also are still continuing to develop new resources for. And then ESS Dive, which is still in an early development stage, are sort of working through improving their interoperability and reuse. And that's a lot of working with the community stakeholder groups to make sure that that's optimized for use case. And then I think that wraps it up. So thank you to everyone who participated in the survey. I think they were all very honest and very uh, technically uh, informative. So. And that is, I'll pass it off. Thank you. Thank you. Right, um, so now I seem to have control over the slide deck. Uh, I am not the IDA Data Lab, I am the IDA Data Hub. And now I see a slide that says thank you instead of my slides. What do I do? Uh, progress. Well, always. You can move on the slides yourself, or you should be. Mm -hmm. So I've pressed the right arrow twice, Try to three times. The <laughs> I've clicked okay, so the presentation I'll do this for you. Uh, and there we uh, go. That, that's some you're... slides I like. <laughs> uh, so, um, how about I try to control the slides? And if I can't, I will scream and you will help me. Okay. Fantastic. Cool. So, um, somebody said the word sustain, uh, and we are sustained through uh, national infrastructure funds through the Science for Life Laboratories in Sweden. And we are really good at FAIR, uh, according to the European Open Science Cloud, uh, the Nordic partners who did a joint uh, investigation or review in 2020 of FAIR readiness among uh, public registers and data agencies and uh, repositories. And we came out in the top 12%, uh, even though we had only been around for just over two years-ish. 
so we are really good at fair, not because we have to be, uh, because that's not even the hard part. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, we are good at fair because we think it's good practice and it's just the right thing to do. Uh, so um, I'm going to talk to you about IDA and IDA Data Hub. And IDA is a research and innovation collaboration arena for medical imaging diagnostics AI in Sweden. And IDA Data Hub is the data infrastructure that was set up to support the IDA community. So um, IDA exists for this reason. Uh, we've seen hype all over the world that AI can do wonders for the clinic, and yet it's not providing much patient benefit at all for a variety of reasons. And IDA is set up to address this uh, the only way we know how, which is um, clinical innovation in collaboration with industry, healthcare providers, and academia. So um, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, it's patients, scanners, computers, AI, researchers, and clinicians in collaboration. And uh, this is the type of impact that we're trying to affect and promote. So uh, here is a care provider in Sweden that engaged with IDA at a number of occasions in various formats. And that resulted in implementation of an AI decision support tool, an AI alert system for uh, lung blood clots in arteries. Uh, that's a serious medical event that may require surgery. And before engaging with IDA, people could go for several days uh, without these clots being discovered and fixed. Uh, and after engaging with IDA, uh, most people were um, uh, detected within minutes. So that's a graph of reduced human suffering. And that's what I like to see. Uh, so the IDA community then consists of about 50 partners all over Sweden, and we've supported 60 innovation projects like the one you just saw uh, over these years since 2017. And um, we do a lot of things that I would not mention, but the IDA Data Hub uh, supports these activities with services and data processing, sharing and policy support. So uh, we have an open repository, as the question came up, uh, where we uh, hand out DOIs and help promote fair data sharing. Uh, we can help collect more data sets for fair sharing uh, from clinics. We uh, help out with policy support. And this is the hard part, because this is patient in, uh, information. This is uh, privacy concerns. It's ethical and legal concerns. It's procedural and policy concerns. And it's a giant mess. And, and that's where we help out the most. So this fair stuff, that, that's sugar on top. Uh, the policy support, uh, support is the hard part. Uh, we also provide uh, data processing infrastructure for AI training on sensitive personal data for research. Uh, so these ideas are, of course, not mine. I stole them from Elixir. They have developed fantastic ideas, uh, customer models, and um, um, there might have been a question. I didn't quite hear it. I'll just plow on. Uh, okay. for uh, the, the EGA uh, repository, which was expanded to uh, a federated solution, uh, for example, supported by the Nordic collaboration uh, in uh, Trygve. Um, and um, what I did was to uh, take the ideas and concepts and models and uh, uh, applying them to not genetics, but medical imaging and in collaboration with Swedish, Swedish clinics. Uh, and the output, the result so far is that we've managed to help share, uh, fair share, uh, Swedish medical imaging diagnostics data with uh, 29 countries and uh, over 100 uh, sharing events. Uh, the actual data then, uh, some 20 data sets uh, from a variety of modalities, uh, some parts of the body, a lot of it is annotated, meaning a clinician has spent time going through the, uh, the images and annotating what is what in it. So it's good for AI training. So um, radiology, we saw that above with uh, the scanners and the patients. Uh, we also have data from pathology, uh, which is when you slice up a tumor and you look at it in a microscope or you scan it and look at it with a computer. And um, you can, of course, use AI tools if it's in the computer. Uh, I mentioned the um, IDA data sharing policy. Uh, I put up all those dots, 50-ish um, partners uh, over Sweden who came together and outlined the common practice for how to do this right and um, uh, how to present to people that what you're doing is ethical and legal. And we wrote this up, and this is so uh, revolutionary to be ethical and legal in medical research so that this was published in Nature Scientific Data. Uh, <laughs> I'm very happy about that. 
So we also have a, a data processing solution. Uh, this service is run from a submarine in a bunker. Uh, it's the same uh, computer room that's used for the electronic health records at the Linköping University Hospital, where my office is. Uh, we also host the Ida Scopis Data Lab, uh, the Swedish cardiopulmonary imaging study, where 30,000 healthy middle-aged people were scanned through uh, MRI and CT and uh, genetics and uh, questionnaires, very deep programs probing examinations. Um, and these people will die, interestingly, over the next decades. And the point of the Scopus project is to be able to answer the question, at what point should we have been able to detect what eventually killed these people? Uh, so we are, we are providing uh, sharing and processing for, for that research in Sweden. So we're also collaborating with national data infrastructures uh, and uh, healthcare providers in Linköping to in implement in a first stage uh, a Linköping health data space uh, to uh, implement communicating data lakes for primary and secondary use of personal health data. I usually use this logo uh, for one half of this is healthcare and the other half is uh, research. And uh, my systems are presently the right hand side of this. That's the prototype and demonstrator that this works in practice. So uh, the things I do are really caveman style. It's the simplest possible that you can run with few staff. Uh, but this has been used as a demonstrator for scale up. Uh, so um, I also, whoops, that's not the slide I intended to show. Uh, let's skip on. <laughs> uh, uh, for Europe. Uh, so um, we're going from terabytes in the previous slides to pet, uh, petabytes in, in this slide uh, for European digital pathology AI. So this is uh, using not the uh, uh, manual approximations of Elixir solutions, but using the actual Elixir solutions and adapting them to uh, a digital pathology. And um, the next step after that is to broaden it from pathology also to other types of cancer imaging, such as radiology. And uh, the idea here is to do that together with uh, much larger compute resources like this one. This is Berzelius, the flagship AI training resource uh, in Linköping at the National Supercomputer Center. Uh, and um, yes, that's what I intended to show you. If there's any questions, I can answer them. Okay, now we're going to hear from Samia Panji, who's uh, coming to us from Cape Town. Are you there, Samia? Uh, yes, I am, Jeff. Excellent. Um, I'll do the slides for you. Uh, okay. Um, my name is Samir Panji. I'm part of Nikki Mulder's group, uh, GCT Computational Biology. And thank you to Jeff and organizers for allowing me to talk to you a little bit about the verification efforts of Alpha Genomics Data undertaken by HG Bionet. Uh, next slide. Uh, sorry, next slide. It's built spell name. Yes, that's the let's play show. Sorry. Okay, very well. There we go. I think we need to hide this one and see yeah. if this is. Okay, so this is just my presentation outline. So I'll just go through some of the work that we've done in African genomics data and trying to make it fair. And some of the challenges we found in that as well and the conclusion of future directions. Uh, next slide. Okay, so it's long been recognized that there's a lack of African diverse uh, genomic diversity data uh, with zero, currently 0.17% of all the genomic data that's been generated in the world. And this is unfortunate as African ha Africa has one of the largest populations and is one of the populations that's most affected by communicable and non-communicable diseases. So in order to address this, the Human Heritage and Health in Africa, Asia Africa initiative was formed, funded by the NIH Common Fund, uh, Wellcome Trust and African Society for Human Genetics. And that's aimed at creating a large genomic reference, large genomic reference data sets and studies for African genomic populations. This has 15 collaborative centers, which are multi-country located, um, some by repository projects and 16 research projects, and an informatics network to help support all the data acquisition by the Asia African projects. And so far, 48 projects have been funded with um, over 500 consortium members. 
Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so HG Barnet is a Pan-African Bioinformatics Network uh, to develop the bioinformatics capacity in Africa and support the HG Africa projects. We are 28 institutions in 16 African countries. And on the right of the slide, it just shows you some of the data that's been collected by the Asia Africa projects that's very diverse from phenotype data to the actual sequence data to genotyping chip array data and Asia Africa custom design chip, as well as microbiome studies as well. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the things we've done in order to uh, um, assist the Asia Africa projects in submitting the data, making sure it's fair, is we've created a data archive that's housed in, uh, in Cape Town. And that I think has one terabyte of uh, one petabyte of storage, and with that we actually work with the projects that are ready to submit the data on one on one to get them get the files ready for submission to us. We help them transfer the encrypted data to us. We check it for uh, validation, as, as in do the checksums match all the files present for the de identified persons using phenotypic data, and all, all of that things that does help um, provide the provenance and the metadata of a data set. Once we're happy with that and we validated it and we don't go and we stop going back and forth with the data submitters, we actually map it to EJA schemas and then we submit it to EJA on behalf of the projects and under the Asia Africa umbrella. And we sometimes the data is under embargo and it's uh, released at a predetermined date. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the problems I'm sure which everyone is aware of with terms of human genomics data is that um, just the genetic data itself is just a string of letters and it's not really meaningful unless you have metadata. And a lot of the metadata we collect are also quite um, identifiable because they're actually the phenotypes that you're collecting. And I think everyone's quite conversant that fair data does not equal open data and fair should be as open as possible and as close as necessary, which is one of the challenges that we face in creating this. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, okay, so I put in a screenshot here of the URL for the catalog, and it's just to show you that we have um, taken data from different sources, from the biorepositories, from the data archive, and we try and harmonize it and we make it available for search and uh, user access requests through the uh, Asia Africa data catalog, which is available in the URL below. Uh, what you don't see here are the three views. You have the public access view, which is a landing page which people can search to. You have a second view, which is a registered view, which one needs to register to actually access data sets and search more information about them and add them to the cart to request um, access for that. And the third view belongs to the data access committee that can look at the requests and um, either approve them or disprove them or request for more information. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so one of the problems we had with Asia Africa data is how do we make it fair? So we have been working this field for quite a bit. And I think one of the things that really struck us was the Research Data Alliance Fair Data Maturity Model, which seems to be quite intuitive and easy to use. It has three elements, your indicators, your priorities, and your evaluation methods. You have 40 indicators, seven are findability, 12 accessibility, 12 are interoperability, and nine are reusability. And each of those indicators has a level of importance defined such as essential, uh, important, or useful. Uh, essential is it's needed there, it's there to it's needed to be fair. Uh, useful is nice to have, but not essential for the data to be fair. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is what the sheet looks like, and it's quite nice and well done, and it's easy to go through and understand the definitions in the fields. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we took all the 23 data sets that are in the Asia Africa catalog and we put them through the fair assessment uh, of the sheet that we saw there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what we managed to find was that 100%, we reached 100% assessment for the level of essential indicators, 76% on the assessment of non-essential, and we have an overall assessment score of 87%. I think one of the big points, or one of the biggest things we've learned through this exercise is that fair, fairness is not a binary number. It's not either you're fair or you're unfair. There's a spectrum of fairness. And I think it's, as one of the colleagues mentioned before, it's rather an iterative process where you have to go back and forth until you actually reach the 100% of fairness. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the things that really helped us reach that metric of 100% on the essential ones was the use of the data use ontologies as um, Valentina just discussed earlier on. And it's quite useful for us. It allows us to reuse the data. Uh, next slide, please. Sometimes the data sets are collected under um, ethics review and it's very difficult for um, researchers to know if they're allowed to apply for the data for the research. So the DOS or data use ontology system, it can be create, considered as a creative commons license for genomic research. And it also allows the data access committee itself to also determine if the application fits in 
with the ethics of the research. And hopefully what we want to do with this is we want to try and incorporate this into the broad data use oversight system as well, in order to make the DBAC and DAC accesses uh, as automated as possible. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what else should be made in FAIR in HG Binet? Um, I think FAIR in itself also refers to the whole research ecosystem. Uh, similar to like Terra, it's not just enough to have your data sets sort of FAIR. You need to have your workflows and your algorithms and your tools there. And in HG Binet, we spend a lot of time working on containerizing and creating workflows for genomic research. Just because bioinformatics software is so notoriously parameter rich and it's very difficult to replicate and analysis of the shachi of the workflow. So we applied FAIR metrics to our software and workflow tools. Uh, next slide, please. The tools that we used, decided to use was the Hardfair is Software EU, uh, which actually goes to checks compliance. It looks at five things, which is repository, license, registry, citation, checklist, which is all part of good software practices, but it's, I think it's important to have that there. And it gives you a badging system from one badge to five badges, uh, showing on high compliance you are with five badges being the best. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the things we did is went through all the GitHub repos in HGBarnet and through all the workflows, and we tried to run them through this. Uh, initially, when we did this, we managed to get two or three stars. But after, as I said, it's a maturity process, we've gone back and we fixed the make sure of software checklist, uh, registered tools in the Elixir tools registry service. And doing that, we managed to get to five stars for all our software and tools as well. And this is important because this, this helps us also um, lead to interoperability for us. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is the conclusion slide, and I think the challenge is successes in the future directions. I think for us, what's been challenging is when FAIR was first implemented as a, as a concept, there's not really much around it in terms of metrics and scoring and assessments as well. But that space has changed and has made it easier for us to actually be more quantitative with how we deal with our fairness and understanding fairness. I think for us as African scientists being uh, exposed to FAIR, I think we've gained a lot of knowledge and skills in Asia Barnet over this period. So we've kind of moved from the process where we were making outputs FAIR to actually now making sure outputs we create are made FAIR from the outset or born FAIR. And the knowledge and skills has gained been applied to other African data health research projects, such as the EDYZ Data Open Science Platform, which I think is more of an infrastructure that will deal with stuff like the tool registry services, the data discovery, data registry services, and the APIs and stuff, which you hope to host in this. And that's also in a bigger program for the DSI Africa. Uh, my last slide is just acknowledgments. So I'd like to thank Professor Nikki Mulder and all the FAIR project members and team members in HVINET. Thank you. Yeah, um, we are, we're going to get there. I don't know if we're going to have much time for discussion, but we will have time for discussion at the next plenary. Um, <laughs> so what we will do now, I'll try and play a video from Gareth Price, who it's 2 a.m. for him in Australia. And Hello, I can hear I'm this. here today Hello. to talk to you about Hello. Galaxy Australia and uh, an assessment of its fairness. My name is Gareth and I'm project lead of Galaxy Australia and head of computational biology at QCIP here in Australia. So Galaxy, as a quick reminder, is a website where users uh, bring their data, they have access to thousands of tools and in particular, in the context of today, they also have access to reference data to allow them to use one or many tools in combination. So when we think about Galaxy and fairness, I would like to think we are mostly fair. Mm -hmm. The platform itself is, is designed from its core to be open and transparent. Tools are robust, they come with versioning, uh, they come with citations back to a primary journal, often which has DOI itself, or out and or out to a repository for the code. So users can really drill into the tool and how we've made it available to Galaxy. Thinking about multiple tools though, and the execution of workflows, uh, there is a workflow, a builder, an editor in Galaxy. It in itself is shown here on the left, uh, comes with a versioning. So this is an auto captured versioning by Galaxy. It's very easy to roll back and test different versions of the workflow. It can be annotated and, and a relatively new feature that's quite nice and resonates with the talk today. You can now specify a license, uh, add creators to that workflow, and you do that before sharing, which is obviously one of the core principles of fairness, the interoperability and reproducibility through sharing. But 
as I said, it's mostly there. So here I've shown a tool, Matt with BWA, and the accessible references inside that tool. You'll note that references come with a variety of naming uh, nomenclatures, either dates, uh, database IDs, uh, common names or scientific names. And what's acknowledged here that is under the scene, that same database ID, in this case the Human Genome Build 38, as hosted by two different uh, large providers of genomics information, has a different naming convention. And without visibility on that naming convention uh, inside reference data, there is the chance that there's a disconnect between various steps of your workflow if you do not know you've referenced this particular genome, for example, but then choose later to annotate against this genome. So that's our mostly. We're nearly there, but we could do more. Uh, we also can do more outside of Galaxy. We do that by sharing reference data between all the global galaxies using the CBMFS uh, architecture. We host workflows outside in themselves, minted with DOIs at Workflow Hub. And we interact with our users and encourage them to store their data long-term on robust institutional storage architecture uh, and not necessarily the Galaxy architecture, which is built for analysis. So with that, I want to thank and acknowledge the large team that provides Galaxy Australia uh, to all its users, and thank you for your time today. Okay, so uh, now we are going to hear from the other side of the uh, the fair sharing work group. Yes, so, uh, oh, yes, yes. yes. I'm going to go under <laughs> and then crash. <laughs> oh. I'm sorry to put forward the head this one, correct? Yes, yes. Fantastic. Okay. So I'm not presenting a research infrastructure, but I'm sending a project which has become a, a community resource, which is now part of the Elixir research infrastructure and has an editorial board that also uh, includes a senior member of the NIH uh, data office. So it's collaborative and open. Oops, that's wrong direction. Yes, okay. Right, so well, in a nutshell, the Fed Cocoa book case, it's an open online resource for the life sciences. That's why it's relevant to this session. And uh, there are hands-on recipe that really cover all the operational aspect to bake and keep the data fair. So it's been developed by data professional in the academia and in the industry. And these four data professionals that actually make data fair. So for fair doers in particular. And it's something that you can contribute to, you can just use, or you can even adopt. And in terms of adoption, like I say, it's already part of the Elixir ecosystem with several nodes contributing it. So it's embedded and hopefully we can collaboratively sustain it. It's already also recommended by the Horizon Europe Health Program too. So in terms of coverage, the, the recipe, it's a mix of recipe which are hands-on, some are a background information, some it's about the challenges, some it's about the skill that are needed within an organization to make data fair. And there's a lot, like I said, the example are very important. We have uh, covered data, which is omics for clinical and clinical, because we have been working as part of a, a project called Fed Plus, which is an, an innovative medicine initiative project. So we use that type of data that was available, but a lot of things is applicable to other data type. And by the way, we're not limited to the data type that we currently have in the Fed uh, Cookbook. So I'm not gonna show you what we have in terms of content, but certainly what I'm gonna tell you is the key feature which make it also interesting for use and for collaboration. So in terms of searchability, everything gets classified also according to who the recipe is for, you know, more for a developer, more for a curator, and also according to the type of coverage, but also according to the maturity. So we all know that everybody data, a uh, fair data journey is different from, from one to another. So it is important to understand how fair you are, uh, like how much discoverability, and I, I need to improve my discovery Ability, which recipe helped me in that? So we have tagged each recipe according to a maturity model that tells you how far you are in a further data journey and where you stop. It's completely up to you, obviously. 
So um, obviously people come into the cookbook looking for, you know, I want to make things discoverable. I want to I wanna talk about semantic interoperability, what there is there, they can show me how to do, what tool there are, what example there are. So we have made the classification as rich as possible to help people to get to the right content. If you don't know what to do in terms of how to start your fair data journey, there is also one specific recipe, which was also an output of the project, which is a very generic verification framework. So there is a recipe that tells you how to start your fair data journey, gives template, gives tips, and gives uh, then examples. And a couple of the slides and then I've done, because we want to encourage, this is not so, so. This is not something that one organization, one group, you know, can actually do and sustain. It's a collaborative thing. So we want to encourage contribution. That's why we made sure that each recipe is citable, and also uh, each author are, um, are uh, in, identified according to the orchid that we use the credit ontology for tagging their contribution. So it's not just about making the content fair themselves, but encourage participation and like I say, contribution. This is the final slide to acknowledge the people that have built in the resource and the preprint gives you information about, more information about it. Thank you. Um, all right, well, thank you, everybody. Um, so I said at the beginning, this was certainly from our perspective in the life science data infrastructure, I guess, a, a test to see what people in the RDA are interested. I think people are. This has been a very well attended session. Um, um, we've decided that I think we need to continue the discussion, obviously, at the next plenaries, but we want to continue before that too. So can I encourage everyone, please, um, the shared notes for this um, session, if you can put your name that you were here and add your email, um, we can use those emails and we'll sort of start the discussion more from there. Um, Alicia, who's our chair online, has suggested we may probably do a survey about, you know, what, where should we go from here um, as an interest group? Where can we... Um, uh, focus our attention. So um, I think that's the action um, is please put your names onto the shared uh, notes document and we will be in touch. Um, also feel free to join the RDA group if you're not a member as well and we'll send some emails out through through that email as well. So um, thanks everyone so much for coming along. Thanks to my co-chairs, all of the presenters. Thanks very much. Um, and this is the beginning of a journey. And I think we need to be on a ferry within 30 minutes, otherwise we're stuck on this side of the group.